All right, welcome to uh, Office Hours. It's a 30 minute webinar to help you successfully achieve SIP certified. From December through May, we'll host six webinars to touch all 14 of the standards chapters where SIP certified staff and experts will be online to answer your questions. So some general tips for completing your application this year, do the requirements first since they are often more difficult and you must achieve them to get certified. When you answer management enhancements, answer the ones that you can and keep a list of the ones that you can achieve later. We also recommend using the photos list. It's a list of all standards questions that require photos. You can take this with you and go around your properties and take all of your photos. And I'll put the link in the chat box. And for those of you who are new to the database, we'll show you what it looks like and what the different icons mean. Let me do my share screen. Okay, so the leaf icon means that this question pertains to vineyards and the tank means that wineries must answer it. The calendar box here means that there's a date field that you must answer. The double arrow means that it's a management group question. So if you have multiple properties, you can create a management group and your answers will carry over to all the properties in the questions. And where is it? The handshake icon means that as well as being documented, this question must be verified with an on-site inspection. All right, so each office hours webinar will focus on two to three questions. Uh, standards chapters, and we'll have time for Q&A at the end. We'll call out the standards by number so you know which questions we're talking about as we're going through them. And while each of the webinars focuses on specific chapters, you can bring any questions that you have. Just please refer to a standard number so we can pull them up and go through it with you. And all of these webinars will be recorded and we'll post it to the info hub on sipcertified.org. If, if it's your first time getting SIP certified, know that it takes about 60 to, hours, 60 to 80 hours to document the standards your first year. And once you're certified, you can expect to invest just 20 hours per year. And also know that you're not alone. We are here to help answer your questions, provide you with resources, and help in any way that we can along the way. So this fourth office hours webinar covers chapters one, conservation and enhancement of biological diversity, and seven, pollution and waste. We're joined today by Bart Haycraft of Jackson Family Wines, and he's been involved with the organization for many years now through different committees, as well as the board of directors and even serving as board president. So Bart, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you. So we're discussing chapters one and seven. So let's start with chapter one. So what can you tell us about the requirements in this chapter? So the requirements in this chapter are kind of, the, in my mind, the, the thing that kind of sets the foundation for what you're doing, um, it gives you, you said you wanted me to talk, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so you've got your conservation plan and, you know, when we first started doing these, it was uh, kind of difficult, but now we have a template in the vineyard team thing, which is very helpful. So you can go through and you can tailor this to your specific property everybody's going to have different um, issues that they need to deal with. Some will be easier and some will be more difficult. Again, to Whitney's point, what I would do is go through and, and ID the ones that are really easy. Uh, a lot of us are cover cropping and a lot of us can put in filter strips, know your soils. It gives you a good foundation to understand your vineyard better and how to manage and mitigate some of the, the sensitive areas around it. So to me, this is a really good way to get more familiar with your vineyard and the surrounding environment and come up with a good plan, both short-term and long-term. And tied to the next enhancement, you can also work with a local agency to help build a conservation plan. So we do have a really good template that we work directly with NRCS to create, but that's another option to help come up with a really good plan. And a lot of the times NRCS or RCB have additional funding too. So if while you're making your conservation plan, you find you have an area that say you want to deal with some erosion practices on, they might have funding for a project like that too. And something that I think we just recently discovered as a growing community, especially down here in Santa Barbara County, is that you can go through many years where some of these things on your plan maybe are not as important. Erosion control being a very good example during the drought, we didn't have to spend as much money and take as much time to get prepared. But over the past couple of years, we've seen the importance of coming in and really doing those things carefully and, and you know, down to a lot of the, the areas that are highly erodible. And if you have that plan and that map, at least you know the areas. So it's we're not saying you, you would have to do all of these things every year, but having the template, you can refer back to it. And if you know there's going to be a wet year, you come in and you do the, you know, the 100% getting your vineyard er erosion control ready for the winter. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that's just the one requirement in chapter one. So what do you think are the uh, difficult items in this chapter? So the difficult things are putting together a good management enhancement plan, right? Because that's probably the first time you're doing it. Like anything, it's going to be difficult because it's unfamiliar. Um, again, I think the vineyard team has done an excellent job of putting together a template and kind of guiding you in the right direction so that you can get these things put together and it's pretty comprehensive. It allows you to do the easy things right off the bat and then kind of plan the harder things. It also gives you a chance to kind of see if you're a new vineyard owner or if you're the first time in the program, where the most important things to your particular property are. So they're a requirement and there are probably things that you can do to have a good plan, but there's also things you can do to enhance it as you move along. Uh, so that's going to be the, the time consuming one. Um, the rest of it is maintaining just a good idea, like boxes for your owls and your raptors and your bats, right? So when you're first doing it, it's an expense, but then they're out there and it's maintaining them, seeing if they're occupied, kind of paying attention throughout the year to how active they are. Like we have a, a lot of owl boxes and they're always occupied. And it's kind of nice to see that, you know, there's things living there and that they're being used. Um, and then other things, I mean, some of these things, as you move through it, you'll see these questions have all been developed for a reason. And some of them are more applicable to your site than another. Uh, everybody can do owl boxes. Um, people can make uh, allowances for vertebrates moving through the property, but are you, if you're participating in ag, ag resource preservation program, do you have conservation easements? Um, are you, how much of your property are you allowing for natural landscape? These are all things that you may or may not because they're enhancements. One year you may decide like we can't do that, but the next year, and we've done this over the course of you know, 10 or 15 years, we've actually added and been able to take advantage of these things. And I would just remind anybody that's listening, the whole beautiful thing about the vineyard team in this program is the all of us are busy, but when you start to sit down and look through it, it reminds you. So it's kind of a framework for you to constantly be improving. And that's really the goal is, yes, it's great to be SIP certified, but it's also great to have this kind of document that you can look at every year and see how you can improve upon what you're doing out in your vineyard. And that goes back to the original foundation of the SIP certified program. It was a self-assessment, the positive point system, which people who've been members of the vineyard team, a lot of them have done. And the whole point of that process was for people to take the self-assessment about sustainable farming practices and see if they did that self-evaluation year over year, if they would improve their score, which meant they were implementing more sustainable practices. And that study found that people did. And that's something that's still inherent in SIP certified. It is a living document. We update it every year. It's externally peer reviewed every five years. And so it's another way to aggregate all of these resources from external experts, you know, the best practices out there in one spot. And I think another thing I'm looking at this and just thinking back is, so when, when you started, you were doing a self-assessment of work that was already done. But now that you have this document, you've been in the program a while, uh, when you go to develop new vineyards, you find yourself looking at a lot of this and going and taking it into account. So instead of coming in and doing things, you're more aware. So you're using the natural contours of the land, you're leaving the trees, you're preserving the sensitive areas like you always would, but you're more aware. So you can design your vineyard with that in mind instead of, and it's just, it's along with everything we've learned as we've gone too, right? So as you get more and more information, you're able to do things better. And that's where looking at a lot of this will help you come up with a good plan, not only for managing your vineyard, but if you're in the process of developing, it's a really good tool to have to look at and just, you know, read through and see some of these things that you can do initially will make it a lot easier on you uh, as you're farming that vineyard for the next 25 years. And then I would say, you know, managing adjacent habitat areas can be really easy if you're farming right next to a woodland or a open area, or it can be a little more thought conscious if you're, you know, just have the vineyard as your uh, area for some of the biodiversity. A monoculture crop is hard to maintain a lot of diversity in. So can you plant different cover crops? Can you get your owl boxes up? Can you have raptor perches? You know, things like that. 
Um, insectary rows, that, that's one that we do a lot because we have different things that we're using them for and, you know, my mealybug being one. But I think with the increased awareness of what they're calling regenerative farming, I think getting some of that biodiversity into your vineyard via insectary rows and different cover crops is a good way of doing it. Um, and then, you know, the, one of the things here at number 10, sorry, I'm supposed to be telling you. So uh, one 10 is, does the site take advantage of natural landscape features, shades, hillsides, orientation? And we just developed a vineyard a few years ago that allowed us to take advantage of a lot of those because we, we started really thinking about it, thinking about different things that we need to do on the vineyard. And uh, we designed the blocks and the rows kind of around that. So that was a built-in thing that because we have all of these enhancements that we were able to think about prior to putting the vineyard in. Great, that's awesome. All right, so let's move on to chapter seven then. So there are a handful of requirements throughout this chapter. There's a few different sections. So um, we can start with 711 if you're ready. Okay, so this is a this is an, a, an ongoing issue since forever, but it's a uh, people are much more aware of it now. But you must have a written program to eliminate eliminate offsite spray drift that addresses but is not limited to proper training, calibration of your equipment, consideration of weather conditions including wind, rain, fog, and inversion layers, and consideration for neighboring workforce and public interfaces. So again, coming back to uh, where you're farming, uh, what you're farming, what kind of sprayers you have, when do you spray, all of these things need to be taken into consideration. Now, this again will, de depending on the vineyard, if you're a 10 or 20 acre vineyard, you may not have some of the programs that other people have. We have a lot of weather stations that allow us to calibrate based on wind direction. We have sprayers with shutdown nozzles so that if we're spraying next to a highway, as soon as they turn, they shut completely off instantly and come back in. Uh, we tend to spray when it's not windy and in Monterey County, that can be a real issue, right? That gets always windy up there about one o'clock. Um, I think it's really comes down to understanding where your vineyards at and what are the conditions around it? We have a lot of cannabis neighbors now in Santa Barbara County. And so we have to be really aware of not only what we're spraying, and I would add to this part, part of the consideration for your neighboring workforce is having a good dialogue and an open line of communication with them so that you know when their critical times are and you can try to work with them the best you can so that they're able to fully function as their farming operation and you're able to do it too. What, what we don't want is to have some kind of incident that you know prevents people from bringing their crop to market. So there's all different kinds. Like we have vineyards that are very isolated and drift really isn't an issue. And then we have areas where we have school buses driving by and we need to be aware that the last thing you would want is to be spraying and having drift you know, off of your site onto people that have nothing to do with agriculture. So the proper training, I can't emphasize enough, and you should be discussing drift and calibration and weather with your people every time you get ready to make an application. Go over the materials, stress the importance. You know, everybody has the ability, all of our foremen have devices to measure wind speed. They know when it's getting too, too much to spray. Uh, so that's a that's a huge one. And then, of course, you don't want to be out spraying in your vineyard and having your material go off target. Then it's not doing what it's supposed to do. So that's a big one. Uh, and then there's there's other ones that are somewhat easier and everybody can take their own approach, which is kind of the beautiful thing. So speed limit signs, well, that's 7-2. That, that's, uh, and that is something that is pretty self-explanatory. You need speed limit signs. Uh, when you get into the enhancements, how do you destivate? 
there could be lots of different ways, right? It depends on if you have a winery on your property, can you use some of the water that's waste um, from certain operations to run that out on your roads for dust abatement? Uh, you can use any number of commercially available materials. Um, but again, when you look at 737475, they're talking about controlling the dust that comes off your property. And I think that really comes from the Central Valley where they have a lot of ground operations that create a lot of dust and a lot of topsoil in the air. So it's good. It's a good thing to think about and manage. We do get wind and you don't want your topsoil blowing away. So it's whether it's cover cropping or taking care of your non-cropped areas, it's something to be you know, aware of. Hard to replace uh, topsoil. Um, so here's, and Beth, please add any thoughts you have on this, but one of the ones that we get some questions about is what percentage of your tractor fleet is tier three or above? I would, I would just point this out. The only thing I have to say about it is, is this is something that growers should be aware of. And it's something that the SIP program has incorporated as part of their enhancements but it's also a good reminder of like, hey, these things are coming in the future, which is really another thing that I think is great about SIP is it's not a stagnant document. It's always adding things in to keep you moving in the right direction and to let you know what, what's coming down the road. Like what are going to be the expectations in California where we farm? And so this is one where it's an enhancement, but it's also a reminder like these things are coming. Are we making a plan for it? And it could be five, 10 years down the road, but are we aware of, of what's coming? So, and there's yeah, a good point, especially through, with the enhancements in general, is, you know, of course, you want to get as many points as possible, but the best way to sort of attack it, you know, especially if it's your first year getting certified, is go through, take the easy ones, and then keep a little checklist of, okay, here are the ones where if I really dug around in my old files, I could find the documentation for it. Or this is a practice that, like, for example, with the tier three, like I really want to think about implementing this down the road. So can I make a plan for this so that down the road I can get the points for that management enhancement? That's true. Yeah. Do the easy ones. I mean, the easy ones are there quite honestly, because everybody should be doing them. I mean, the requirements are one thing, but even the enhancements, there's some that are, are really easy that you should be thinking about. And it's not telling you how to do it. It's just saying, what are you doing about this, this issue? Dust abatement's one, right? It can be as simple as water. It can be as complex as you know, any any number of those things out there that are going to cost you money. Um, and then, you know, another one that's kind of interesting is 710, which is, are you utilizing chipping or mulching instead of burning on more than 90% of your vineyard wood reuse residue? Sorry. And I think anybody listening to this would know that chipping is going to be significantly more expensive than burning. But again, California, air quality, burning, is that a long-term sustainable solution? My guess is no. So it's getting you thinking about alternative ways of handling your vineyard wood residue moving forward. That's a, maybe not something for everyone, not, definitely not an easy one, but again, it's getting you thinking about what's coming in the future, which is a good thing. How about some of the other sections? That was 7-1. Anything stand out big in seven two seven three? Well, I mean, so again, seven two. You have to have your. This is pollution, right? And pollution's a, a tricky one. Um, I think we're still learning a lot as an industry about how we record it. What are the best ways to manage it? Um, what tests are meaningful? But again, the requirement is just that you must have annual trainings and signs posted explaining practices to prevent litter, debris, soil, and pollution from reaching storm drains and streams. So that's pretty self-explanatory, but then you can get all the way down into 724, which is do you calculate and record air quality metrics? For example, CO2 and ethanol. And those could be a little more difficult to do, but again, it gets you thinking about how would I measure that? What are there services that I could uh, utilize? Is it something that we need to do on our own? Is and that's a 
that's an interesting one. All, all of this stuff gets tricky because I don't know if a lot of us are doing it. And some of this is going to be related to winery, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, a lot of the next few sections in here are winery focused. Yeah. And so some of that I'm not 100% up to speed on. Like, I don't know what the requirements are for carbon dioxide emitted by fermentation or ethanol from fermentation vapors. That could actually be something that most wineries are doing, but I don't, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And if anybody is certifying a winery, we do have a, our technical committee is split between vineyard and winery with some overlap. So we have some experts available for that too, if you run into a specific question. But if you get into 7.3, which is hazardous material management, and you get back to the vineyard side, you look at uh, requirements. You must perform an annual hazardous material and waste assessment. You must have written procedures for addressing spills, hazardous material in emergency situation. 7.3, you must label and store and dispose of chemicals. Four is you must have uh, materials in a safe, secure location. All of these requirements are, are things that are going to need to be done for various other agencies, right? Whether it's your ag inspector coming out to, to look at, take a site inspection, whether it's, I don't know what they call SIRS in other counties, but it's the, uh, Santa Barbara County comes out and they wanna make sure what you're storing on site, how long it's there, that you have, you're properly disposing of your waste oil. So all of these things, if you're in the SIP program, they, not only do they help you qualify for SIP, but they help you meet other requirements that you're typically going to encounter. No matter if you're in San Luis County, Monterey County, or Santa Barbara County, there's other agencies that are looking at a lot of this thing, a lot of these things. And so, I mean, if you're in SIP, you can, we just had an inspection a couple of days ago and we went through and most of this stuff was already done. And it's because we're in SIP. It wasn't that we were necessarily getting ready for this other inspection. It's because we're following all these things. And so they're already done. So that, that to me is always helpful. Um, and then, so this is seven, three, six, which is a management enhancement. And it says, have you decreased your overall hazardous waste in the last three years? So I'll give you a personal example and something that I've Uh -oh. Did your sound fall off? My team's just loaded. Um, sorry. Oh. <laughs> so here's a good one that I always appreciate, and it's management enhancement. It's seven two seven three six, and they're asking you: Have you decreased your overall hazardous waste in the last three years? And it gets you thinking about from the things you order and the way you're disposing of waste, right? Not just your hazardous waste, but can you reduce your overall hazardous waste? It should always be a goal in your mind that you're trying to think about. But what about the containers that you receive things in? Are they easily recyclable? Or are, they, are you still triple rinsing, punching holes in them and waiting for a certified disposer? So you start thinking about that and we've moved from, you know, 225 gallon plastic totes to cardboard boxes with liners, which are a way easier on the environment and the cardboard can be recycled and the liner just gets sent back to the, the people that sent you the material at the end of the year. So it makes it a lot easier if you can get away from two and a half and order in the 225 gallon plastic totes, those can be repurposed. Uh, lots of people are looking for those to use them for things. Um, and so it's just trying to overall reduce your hazardous waste and your waste in general. And it, um, I think if those are good things that are reminders that help you plan for now and then in the future. And that's one example of where we've really tried to reduce the amount of plastic that we're putting out in the environment. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the winery, solid waste management. Again, some of this is, some of these are things that you may not think about, but uh, you've got seven, four, three. Are your dumpsters on a concrete pad? I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? It's kind of a no brainer, but then you think about how many times maybe things are just kind of put over on the side where you're throwing away stuff and be much easier to clean up a broken wine bottle on a concrete pad than it would out of the dirt. So it keeps you thinking some of uh, 744 is an employee responsible for routinely checking dumpster area for leak spills and litter. That's a great thing to do. I mean, it's just a, a, something that's easy to do that maybe you wouldn't think about, 
but you can put a person in charge of that and then you don't have to worry about it. Uh, let's see. And, and then again, so if we go into 761, it, this is, a, again, these are things that we should be doing that are reminders for everyone. You must have a program in place listing all reagents and chemicals used in the lab, their proper disposal method as per the SDS. You should have an SDS on everything. You should be updating them. You should be looking at your labels and you should be making sure that all of the products that you're using in your winery and your vineyard are accounted for and that they're being stored and used properly. And so a lot of times you're walking through these requirements and, and those are things I guess the best way to describe it, in my opinion, is the requirements are things that you have to do, but you don't have to just do them for a sip, right? You're going to be doing them for the, the county inspection, the winery inspection, the SIRS, the county. They're going to come out and you're going to have all of these requirements done because those are things that need to be done, not just for SIP, but for other compliance measures. And then the enhancements are things that will just make your business run smoother or get you thinking about the future so that you, some of these things that are on here now that are enhancements will be requirements in the future. Awesome. Yeah, well, that brings us to the end of chapter seven and just about the end of our time too. So we'll go ahead and open up for questions and answers. If anyone on has any uh, questions, please put them in the Q and A box and refer to the standard number specifically if you could. And yeah, sorry, I didn't do a very good job with that. Oh, no, no, it's totally fine. Yeah, because I'll, I'll go back through and I'll like write them all out and stuff. So it's all good. <laughs> that was super helpful. Yeah, it was. And, you know, we're here to help anyone who's getting certified in the program through that process. So Whitney is a great resource. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, we have a whole big technical committee who, you know, helps us as well, not only updating and improving the program over the years, but talking through different applicants, individual scenarios, because we understand that farming and different winemaking facilities, you don't have different sizes, different scopes, different regions, and an answer for one might not be templated, you know, it'd be the exact same response for somebody else. So you can always reach out to us and we're happy to help you um, through the process. Yeah, I would say that the SIP program has a great team behind it that is helpful. They're constantly asking questions and figuring out how to make the document better. And it's also moving forward. It's it's accounting for all of the things that we kind of see out there on the horizon. So it's it's a living document that is changing probably every year a little bit. It does. <laughs> All right, well, that's about time and we don't have any questions in there. So go ahead and call it. Bart, thank you so much for your help with this. You bet, you guys have a good day. Thank you. Too. Bye. And bye. Bye.